Okay, great. So um, it is 11 where I am. So I think we can go ahead and get started because it will take me a couple of minutes just to um, do the intro. So hi, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I'm Neha Kumar. I'm here as the president and also a resident of the state of Georgia in the US and faculty at Georgia Tech. And I'm here with uh, um, uh, many colleagues on the executive committee, uh, uh, the uh, CHI steering committee and the organizing committee of CHI 22, and many other volunteers from our committee. So thank you all for being here. We have less than an hour. So I'll ask you all, if you like, you can briefly introduce yourself over chat, just um, your name, where you're from, maybe your position while you're here. Uh, I'll be moderating over the next hour with Kale Basmore, who's uh, here in their role as the EC's equity chair. And we're here to talk about CHI 22 and to talk about bigger questions that impact us all as a CHI community. We're here to make space for more transparency, clear, effective communication, and honoring the diverse perspectives that make up our community. We're here because we care about our conferences, but also because we care about people first. The Sikha EC has been doing virtual community facing open discussions since last summer, starting with our Ask Me Anything sessions and then our equity talk series earlier this year. And as we kick off our next set of conversations and topics that impact the community, we felt that a conversation about CHI 22 was an important one to have. Um, just in general for giving us all an opportunity to communicate, to be better heard, better understood, both individually and collectively. So I'm gonna start by thanking our CHI General Chairs and their team of many, many volunteers for all of their work, acknowledging that we are pulling them away from this work as they take time to engage with us and with the community. So they'll be going over their plans and survey findings for about 15 minutes, and we will then open up the floor for discussion. But first I wanna share a link to the code of conduct that we're gonna be using um, for today. And this is from our monthly uh, open meetings. I'll summarize it quickly. So firstly, please turn on your microphone only when asked to speak by one of us. Otherwise, please raise your hand to say that you wanna speak. We encourage adding your pronouns after your name in Zoom if you're comfortable doing so. Also, when you speak, you're encouraged to begin by stating your name, pronouns, and institution to accommodate those who cannot visually identify you. We also encourage using your camera for ease of comprehension and lip reading. Please remember to keep your comments concise. We have limited time and many voices to listen to. If you have questions, concerns, suggestions that you would like to mention privately, you can reach out to one of us, that's Kale or me. If instead you would like to be completely anonymous, you can use the Slido link that we have here to express yourself, especially since we are recording this hour. So keep in mind that chats will also be saved. Be careful not to share content about people or situations that is sensitive in nature to people of various genders, abilities, ethnicities, religious affiliations, cultures, ages, education levels, economic or political grouping, or that could be interpreted as offensive or unnecessary to communicating your main message. If there are any issues or violations, please um, uh, get in touch and one of the moderators, Kale or I, will remind you and everyone of the code of conduct. In the case that there is harassment, discrimination or problematic content, we will publicly acknowledge the issue, name the violation and use our judgment on what to do next. Uh, we encourage constructive criticism and critique. This is a supportive space. Be hard on systems and soft on people. Be patient, be kind, be supportive. Avoid personal attacks and help us collectively find ways to address any systemic issues that we need to overcome. People's lived experiences are not up for debate. Their ideas, policies, and suggestions are. The lines between these two are not always clear, so give each other the benefit of the doubt. Grace, sensitivity, and validation go a long way towards creating community. Access to education about needs around identity, social justice, and cultural sensitivities are not equal. Not everyone has access to the bodies, the knowledge or communities that you do. There are differences between us and material limits that must be respected even if disagreed with. There may be times when identifying words or phrases are insensitive or just don't feel right to you. If these issues come up, take each other in good faith. And if you have the capacity, correct the individual. Please help in refocusing on the topic of the moment. Um, with that, I wanna um, pass it on to Cliff. And Cliff, 
So feel free to share your slides whenever you like. Sure, thanks. And while I'm doing that, let me also uh, make sure I acknowledge Simone, my co-chair, uh, who's here with us today as well. Make sure we're sharing all right. Everybody can see a slide okay. Um, as well as Katja Spiel, who's another member of our, who's a, one of our equity, justice, and access chairs, um, uh, along with Christina Harrington. And then I saw Carolina Pair appear. She's one of the technical program chairs, um, uh, along with Ayman Shama. And then, of course, I see lots of other CHI 2022 volunteers in here. I don't want to ignore you all, but good to see you all. And thank you all for being here. I want to thank um, uh, Neha and Shawin and the rest of the EC for hosting this conversation and for all the support and guidance they've given us over the past months as we kind of navigate these waters. Um, and also like to recognize the Access SIGCHI community and the really thoughtful letter that they posted recently. And uh, that's been shared on social media. And uh, we had a chance to read and really appreciate the thought that they put into that. So my goal here is just to kind of explain uh, what we've been thinking about and doing over the past few months as we navigate, especially the rise in the Delta variant. Um, and then also to share some of the data from the uh, survey that we sent out. The other the thing other that we're going to do is mostly, I think, listen, right? We really want to hear some concerns and thoughts as we move forward. So uh, looking forward to hearing from everybody. All right. So the central question here is, should we continue to plan for or have an in-person option for CHI 2022? Um, summarizing, and this is not a complete list, but summarizing some of the main concerns we've heard about continuing to have an in-person conference for CHI 2022 is that people who are immunocompromised or live with people who are immunocompromised would be discriminated against since they will not have the same freedom to attend, to attend choice that others do, right? So even though that there is an online version of the conference available for people, um, this is built with the inherent idea that the in-person conference is better than the online conference and that it creates an inequity if you have to pick one versus the other. Um, and similarly, people who are from regions with unequal access to vaccines, uh, will be discriminated against if they do not have the freedom to choose which version they want to go to. Uh, along the same lines, people who are from regions affected by travel bans will be discriminated against if they do not have the freedom to choose which channel they can attend. Um, the, another concern that has been raised is that people in the region we are going to, so the people of New Orleans are more put at risk and that creates inequity for them because people are traveling from all over the world to their city and we're ex potentially exposing them to more uh, harm. And then another one, one that I keeps probably the one that I res resonate with the most actually is that volunteers organize the conference will suffer because they have to do twice the work of organizing both an in person and online event for the conference. So since uh, the summer, our persistent rubric for this has been to look at kind of three criteria when we think about uh, having an in person conference. Uh, one is safety. Right, uh, with appropriate precautions, is it possible to mitigate risk to participants, right? Clearly there'll be, there's no situation where going out of your house or traveling is going to be zero risk, but uh, are, what are the ways that we can mitigate the risk? Uh, there's also the big equity issue, which is I think part of the reason we're here today. Uh, so does the inequity of attendance reach a threshold that we can't bear, right? And we can talk more about that as we move forward. And then uh, there's also a financial responsibility that maybe only Simone and I care about, but like, it's something that's on our plates that we've been particularly assigned to care about, which is, you know, given that we already have contract commitments, what's the best way to steward the financial health of the conference? So how have we sought data? Um, some of this has been through regular conversations with the steering committee and the uh, SIGCHI executive committee. Uh, we've been in regular contact with the New Orleans Convention Center, um, the New Orleans Planning Commission, uh, and groups and our local arrangements chairs uh, down in New Orleans. Um, we've been tracking government, federal and city health data, as well as health recommendations. Um, we've been uh, attending webinars with conference management experts. So as you might imagine, there's a group of people who are uh, uh, experts in how do you manage conferences. And so there's been a bunch of um, data released that they've had been collecting over the past few months. And then we did a survey of 950 community members uh, who are kind enough to respond with their thoughts about the conference. So digging in just directly into the survey, um, I think our most important question was Q3 in that survey, which was all things considered, do you personally believe the CHI 2022 conference should include an in-person event? So there, the um, 
mean response was about 63 and the median response was 70 indicating an agreement that there should be an in-person event. Simone uh, ginned up a much better looking graph that looked at variance a little bit more. And so you can see this is a kind of a polar response, right? There's lots of responses along the spectrum, but the two poles are basically a group of people who strongly believe there should not be, and a group of people who strongly believe there should be. We also had questions about whether uh, this was shaped by where you're coming from, right? So it's a reasonable hypothesis that people in North America might be more supportive of an in-person event because it's less um, uh, stress on them to travel to that in-person event. And we didn't necessarily find that pattern. Uh, data, when we looked across different regions, you know, there's some variances in there, but nothing that looked strongly indicative of any regional preference. We also looked by uh, their intention to intend to attend an uh, in-person event versus a virtual event. And here, of course, you do see a pattern, which we would expect. Uh, still plenty of variance within this, um, uh, but that is a little bit prescriptive here. And then uh, we our Q1 was basically getting at a question of which version of CHI do you plan to attend? And there you can see, uh, you know, this was actually great news for us <laughs> in a lot of ways. Uh, people are interested in both versions of the conference. Um, and it feels like, uh, should we be having both versions of the conference, both will be well attended and be rich experiences. So I mentioned kind of three things that we were particularly looking for, and I wanted to unpack those a little bit more about what we're thinking. So with safety, how are we tracking safety of the conference and what that means? Um, so We've been looking at data that's tracked by a company, Epistemics. Um, I linked in our blog post to a video that they did showing some of that data. They do visualizations and analyses of all the in-person and hybrid events that have been occurring over the past three and four months, uh, especially with the Delta variant and tracking concert events and conferences and trade shows and things like that to, to show what has been that. Uh, and what they have found is that with reasonable safety precautions, large events do not seem to drastically increase infection rates, um, uh, no more so than the infection rate in the normal population or normal kind of business activity. Uh, the CDC, which is the U.S. Center for Disease Control, uh, is not currently recommending canceling large in-person events. And the city of New Orleans, and I put a link in here, uh, it's easy enough to Google too, is um, uh, also not canceling in-person events, but they are mandating vaccination and masking for all people over 12 years old who are attending uh, in-person events. Equity, I mean, I think this is a tough one, right? And the, the thing that I worry about the most with all of this, um, clearly uh, the in-person option increases equity for some members. Right. And there's just, you know, I'm not going to try to pretend that that's not the case here in this case. Um, it's a matter of discussion, given that Kai has always had some level of inequity, how much inequity we will accommodate or how to mitigate that inequity. So when we, you know, this is something Kai has been struggling with for 10 to 15 years uh, when we think about the inequities that we've had with kind of global audiences. The way we've approached that is what I think of as kind of um, adding money to the solution to get people to the conference, right? We've had workshops and we've had uh, we've done things like the uh, really expanded use of the Gary Mars and Travel event uh, fund and try to get more people to attend. Um, we haven't really approached this from a restriction standpoint, but that, that, you know that's open for discussion. Our mode from the beginning has been uh, no second class experiences. I think my team's sick of me saying that uh, to a large extent. The goal here is when we think about whether this positive expansive approach, like I said, the idea uh, of the inequity is built into the idea that the online experience is worse than the in-person experience. And I think that certainly has been true uh, as we move forward, as, as, it, as we look at the past. One of the things I would love to talk about and think about is how do we make that online experience as good as, if not better than the in-person experience. I think the thing we're really missing in that are the social experiences, right? It's the social networking, it's the uh, stuff that happens in the hallways and at the uh, parties and things like that. And I don't think, it, I haven't seen many people crack that, especially at scale for virtual events. I would love for us to commit to really thinking about how do we increase equity through having much better in-person uh, online experiences. Um, 
And then the other thing that we've been thinking about, like there's been some concern about the city and danger brought to the city. When I talked to the city, they've been really excited about our visits. Uh, I mentioned this concern to uh, uh, the groups we've been talking to in New Orleans. Um, one of the people there pointed out, like when Kai comes to New Orleans, we spend you know a couple million dollars on food and hotel rooms and services and hospitality and stuff. So I think we want to balance the inequity of the risk we bring to New Orleans along with the money we bring to New Orleans and how that helps that community, especially during times of stress. Uh, looking at our financial responsibility, we are currently committed, depending on how things shake out, between $1.2 million and $2 million in existing contracts related to the physical event. Um, those contracts were signed years ago, uh, for the most part. And there's, uh, in the past, when we look at CHI 20 and 2021, we had what were called force majeure clauses in our contracts where, you know, if things happened that were outside of anybody's control, like we could cancel the contracts, we'd get some money back. Uh, when we look at deals we made with Hawaii and Japan, uh, sometimes that was with the agreement that we would consider coming back to them and things like that. So it's, you know, I don't think in this case, from what I've heard from ACM, there's nothing that indicates that we would be able to trigger force majeure clauses to recoup any of that money uh, from those contracts. Um, I want to also uh, make sure that people know that the contracts for online conference management uh, is already in place. Soon we're going to be announcing the platform that we're going to be using for the online version of the conference. Um, we're waiting. I want to wait till the ink is dry on that contract before we make an announcement, but it's, it's a good one and um, we're really excited. Uh, I do want to say with, in terms of financial responsibility too, we do have other expenses moving forward that if we did cancel the in-person conference, we could avoid those expenses. They, those expenses tend to be more um, responsive to the side of the conference. Uh, conference. So that's like food costs, uh, AV setup, and stuff like that will also be upcoming expenses. Typically, those contracts get signed around December is when we would uh, incur additional contract liabilities. In the open-ended and in conversations that we've had, we've heard a couple of strategies that we just want to address um, to, to prevent uh, spending much time on them because we don't think they're probably gonna work. Uh, one is to move the conference to a more compliant location. Louisiana as a state is, is one of those states in the United States that's not very compliant with mandates and everything. So could we move it to California or to a different place? Um, CHI contracts are usually signed four to five years in advance of the conference, like I mentioned earlier. And um, even if we did find a new place, new location, which is pretty, pretty impossible. Um, I think we would, we would still definitely lose all those money, all the money from the New Orleans contracts. The other idea we've heard quite a bit about is to add regional conferences. I, I really like this idea as a broad long-term strategy for CHI. It's probably not something we can think about for CHI 2022. So to meet the size requirements that people have been talking about, we would need to organize 40 to 50 such meetings. If those are official ACM conferences, my sense is we need to have separate PAFs, TMRFs, and um, contracts for each of those separate locations that we would have the conference in place. Um, this is kind of required for insurance purposes, right? Everybody who attends an in-person CHI event is insured by ACM, and that, like if you fall and break your leg or chip your tooth or whatever happens, you know, it covers basically the people organizing the conference and the ACM and you and everybody else. So um, I think that to be covered by insurance, we need all those contracts and processes in place. So that would be a significant amount of effort to get that in place. Um, our logistics vendors would greatly increase their costs. When we think about like executive events and like what they charge to support events, having them support 40 to 50 events would probably expand our costs. We could maybe have them not do that, but then we'd have to figure out who does, who would do the work for those events that EE typically does for CHI. Um, volunteer effort would explode, of course, because suddenly we need um, volunteers for 40 to 50 events instead of one big event. There are some efficiencies to scale. Um, and the other thing that I worry about is that are, are already regional conferences that I want to make sure we're sensitive to, right? There's Nordicai and Ozkai and, you know, there's Kais in Latin America that happen and everything like that. So thinking about what would be the implications for the already existing regional conferences. Um, and then, you know, it's also possible we do have regional conferences uh, that are uh, kind of in a yes and frame of mind that we have regional conferences that are part of uh, what people just want to organize. All the content for CHI is going to be freely available and similar to kind of what a lot of people did after CHI 2020, 
uh, people could organize their events if that's how they feel like they want to kind of blend an in-person experience and uh, uh, online experience. So where do we go from here? Um, our team is going to keep tracking the data and keep looking at the numbers and seeing uh, with all three of these concerns, are there changes? What are the what are the changes that we're seeing? Keep listening to people, and I'm looking forward to hearing what everybody has to say. I'm scared to look at the chat. Uh, and then uh, keep renewing our commitment to no second class experiences, right? That, you know, I honestly, and maybe foolhardily believe that the secret here is to really, really nail that online experience. You know, we've said in our blog post, we think the future of Kai is hybrid, right? Uh, this is going to be something that's going to move forward in the future. And, you know, for some portion of our community, that inequity is always going to exist. Right, the, the difference, if we don't figure this out, that inequity between the online experience and the in-person experience will continue to exist into the future unless we can make the online experience come closer to matching the equity principle, right? And if we don't start trying to do that, I'm not sure how we're ever going to make it to that. Um, so that's, that's, the, the, that's where I would love to put my effort is thinking about that equitable experience in the online world. Um, and then the other thing that I, want to commit to doing is to render under the steering committee that which is the steering committees. I think a lot of these like longer term plans and, and bigger changes to the structure of Kai and stuff, uh, I would throw the steering committee under the bus and let and say like that's that's, um, you know, something that we would turn to them to figure out for the future. I think that's all I have other than again to thank everybody. I'll stop sharing so we can see each other's faces a little bit more easily. Mute and listen. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Cliff. So uh, in terms of just asking questions, we would ask you to raise your hand. And there are questions in Slido that we'll go back and forth with. And also, if you want to just put your questions in chat, you can do that. Um, so let's go ahead and start with the raised hand. So Pat Myers, would you like to go ahead? Thank you. Um, I was wondering how the hybrid is intended to work in particular for the papers that were submitted. Uh, if it's accepted, does the author get to pick whether to do it uh, remotely or in person or does everybody do both? Is there, are people going to have to present twice for the hybrid to deal with time zones? Has, has any of this structure been uh, worked out about how a hybrid conference is going to work? It has. Caroline, do you want to speak to that or do you want me to try to explain? You can correct me. <laughs> you can you can explain. I will correct the timing. I <laughs> yeah, we've been thinking a lot about this. Um, so uh, the idea and, you know, we're always open to adapting that idea right now is that authors will pick if they're going to be presenting remotely or in person. Uh, it'll be one program though. So you might be in a session where a person's in New Orleans and a person's at home and they're both presenting and the session will just flip between the person who's at home and in New Orleans. So they're, they're, you won't have to present twice to be presenting in one context. Um, people have critiqued the kind of work that goes into pre-recording talks and we're also going to be asking people to pre-record talks. I think that's just one of those things that's a consequence of a bunch of decisions that we're making. Um, and it is more work that we're going to be asking. The conference is going to take place mostly on U.S. Central Standard Time. Uh, we're going to have a few events that we're talking about, and this we've already been sketching some ideas for uh, events that will be more friendly to other time zones, but it, it's mostly going to happen within the U.S. Uh, Central Standard Time, New Orleans, et cetera, time zone. Um, so it is uh, not going to be separate events in that effect of like there's an online conference that you're going to and an in-person conference that you're going to. We're, we're trying to create at least some connection. I think of them as overlapping Venn diagrams, where there'll be some events that are online only, some events that are in-person only, uh, and a lot of the events that are kind of in that middle. So the where it says on the website still that there are two phases uh, that are a week apart, that's not happening anymore? There, so the, the, the web experience, and sorry, that's been confusing, is 
uh, I like to think of it as the amuse bouche of Kai, right? Like it's it's a, a free or five dollar registration event that's intended to get Kai content out to a much broader audience. So it's a very limited program, invite only. Authors don't need to participate if they don't want to. It'll be like a keynote, a panel or two, maybe, um, and a couple of papers. Oh, I thought that was the hybrid conference that was confusing. No, the the made that's the, the web only experience is um, more of like a pre event, and then the hybrid conference and the in person conference, or the the online conference and the in person conference are all happening at the same time. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, so next we'll go over to Sido. I'll quickly summarize the comments on Sido and then um, we'll go back to the questions on chat. So on Sido, uh, a couple of comments, just appreciating all of the uh, well, all of the work that your team has been doing, uh, Cliff and Simone. And also Michael Miller says, thank you to all of the people who have helped us to think together about these difficult choices. Uh, let's take this, um, question that was uploaded by five people about the, uh, the qual work. So the, uh, it says, much time and emotional energy was spent sharing personal stories in the survey, yet qual data were scanned in Kai's blog post. How will these data be taken up? That's a great question. Uh, as all the qual researchers here know, qual data takes a lot more time and care to uh, analyze and to uh, go over. So we're still going over it. Um, what we'll do an amendment or an update to the uh, blog posts once we've had a chance to kind of categorize and think about that qual data some more. Um, but yeah, there are, the, the poster's right. There were a lot of really thoughtful. Um, uh, heartfelt stories and ideas in those call responses. Thank you. And uh, going over to the Zoom chat next, uh, there's a question from Andrea Strainer saying, uh, regarding no second class experience for nobody, is it better to cancel the face-to-face -face conference just because online participation will have a worse experience? Also given that some of the contracts cannot be canceled with low costs. I think that's the question we're here talking about, for sure. Okay. Um, uh, moving on to Rua Williams, who has their hand up. Hi, I'm Rua Williams, pronouns are they, them. I forget the other thing you wanted us to say, if it was in threes. Uh, oh, Purdue University. Um, I'm curious about why, like I, all of the issues around like regional conferences and the logistics and the bureaucracy and the and the insurance that all is real and valid and makes sense. But I'm curious about why we're discussing it in this sense of a more a formal and official set of regional conferences and not in sort of ad hoc communities organizing their own like watch parties as so to speak, like we just did for 4S. Like this is exactly what 4S just did last week. And so I'm just curious about are you like, why are we only talking about formal contract logistical barriers and, and not talking about coming together in communities to make regional things happen? Yeah, thanks for the question. It's good to see you like live uh, for, for a change. So um, I, I did have one final bullet point, which is that we'll have all the data available, all the content available for people to do exactly that, to self-organize, right? Like if they want to, for instance, put together you know, we'd love to get you up to Detroit. We could do like a little Detroit conference. And if we're all of us are going to be online, maybe what we do is we do some of the online uh, stuff. And then also we have that in-person event where we can look at other content together that's self-organized. Um, if we do that officially as kind of the CHI 2022 organizing team, then we fall into kind of my senses and um, others here might con like contradict me, like Andrew would know this. We fall into kind of the ACM liability trap, right? So like, you know, um, uh, I'm all for people self-organizing this. I think that's a great idea. I think we should do that every year. But if CHI 2022 does that, then suddenly we uh, trigger all those insurance things. I don't recall the letter that was written saying that CHI 2022 should organize the regional conferences. 
no. That's true. Okay. That's a great that's a great point. Thank you. Um, I'll go back to the Slido. So there is a comment there about um, the mask and vaccine requirements for the in-person conference. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? I know that you refer to this, but uh, do you want to add anything about ACM there, Cliff? Yeah, I was just looking for a link to that. I had the, uh, the New Orleans. Sorry. Link. So um, the um, ACM has been has gone a little bit back and forth on this, right? Because we had initially posted something like we're going to require these four things, right? ACM's like, can you take that down because we're not quite sure we can legally do that. Um, but what we can legally do, I know, is follow local ordinances. Uh, that is for sure. And so when you when we look at um, the New Orleans City Public Health Department webpage and the city ordinances for um, uh, in person events, but that has all the stuff that we had in our list right so it's vaccinations it's. Um, you know uh, masks and uh, uh, social distancing and things like that now the vaccination issue raises a couple of really important questions right one is. Uh, people in. Um, other countries in the world are getting a different vaccination than kind of the official US ones, right? So how do we manage that? Um, my sense is, is for reading the ordinance from the New Orleans city uh, and, and then looking at kind of the recent, I think um, Juan Pablo just linked the new US travel guidelines around this. Any vaccination that gets you into the States is good enough for us, right? Um, and then the other one is uh, if you're immunocompromised and have a, a medical reason not to have a mask, uh, our uh, vaccination. We had worked out earlier with some members of the Access Sikai community, a process by which that could go through the C-Vent uh, structure such that that gets recorded without having, without being de-anonymizing. And we kind of worked out a really nice little process. I think Gareth was online for a little bit here, um, but Gareth is our, one of our accessibility chairs for CHI 2022. So we had thought about that and we have a process that we're working on for it. Thank you. Uh, Lynn, would you like to go next? Uh, it was just about the regional um, things. I think that I think you're right um, that we can have regional. One of the things that I love about Kai and is that I actually get to talk to people out with Europe, you know, and I actually get to get out of my comfort zone and talk to other people. So I think, you know, one of the things is actually talking out with the kind of folks that you normally t talk to and mix with. So I, I think there is a value in that. Thank you. Sashil, would you like to go next? Thank you. Uh, my question was that uh, uh, I actually really appreciate that we have uh, now kind of plan to do these major conferences uh, hybrid. Uh, but I want to know, going beyond, you know, uh, tr transcripts or live captioning, what else is being done to meet the needs of uh, disabled uh, participants, whether they are presenters or attendees. That's all, that's my question. That's a great question. Kata, do you wanna lead the answer on that one? Or I can try. I would directly let the accessibility chairs speak themselves since they're here, oh, yeah. or some of them. Uh, I saw Gareth, at least. Well, I can start. Maybe you guys can um, uh, embroider as I get stuff wrong. Is that okay? Uh, so one big thing, of course, is when we, we've gone through an intensive process of reviewing multiple platforms for the online version of the wow. conference. And so for each of those, we're looking at uh, WCAG compliance and um, other issues of accessibility. So only considering AA compliant platforms and things like that. Uh, we've been using the SIG access uh, framework for assessing these things um, as well and looking at, at those. And then uh, Kata and, and Gareth and our other accessibility is they have, have um, really been at the forefront of making sure that we're also looking at what are the accessibility needs of uh, presenters and authors and content creators? 
uh, because most of the platforms only consider the uh, accessibility needs of the audience. And so we've really been pushing people on what, how do we support accessibility for uh, people who are presenting and who are content creators. So uh, we've been working on plans for that, pushing the platforms. Um, now that we have the platform chosen, it's time when we're really going to start digging into it. Um, uh, SIGCHI has always generously provided funding for additional uh, accessibility needs that we have. So I think we're going to use as much of that funding as we possibly can, uh, which will include things like interpreters um, uh, for varying in varying degrees, um, uh, any other access accessibility needs that our team comes up with. Uh, yeah, thanks for and, that. and I think that the part that uh, you do want to underscore is uh, uh, presenters, both uh, live sessions and uh, remote sessions, uh, because uh, uh, SIG Access is not on top of everything. I'm myself an accessible designer, accessibility designer, and a full professor. And uh, the SIG Access, the one before Assets Conference, I was not able to present because the podium was totally inaccessible. And the person chairing the session wouldn't talk to a blind person. And I'm a full professor at the University of Washington. It was that bad. And that's why I didn't come to the conference last year, either in person or otherwise. But, uh, you know, uh, we need to do something. I thought about it. I said, you know, if I just don't go to conferences, uh, that's not going to solve the problem. So this year I did come back to ACM conferences. I'm participating in, you know, some of them. Uh, just this week I'm doing SIG talk, but, uh, you know, I'm doing other ones. Uh, we do need to involve actually people with disabilities in this. And uh, I don't mean just giving an accessibility cheer, but really in more detailed planning, there has to be uh, a little bit more involvement. And uh, me, I will stop here, but the meetings, you know, vocab standards, that doesn't do anything. You know, those standards themselves could have problems, but we are talking about actual being, actually being present either on the platform electronically or in person uh, on the podium, th there are a lot of issues there. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you for sharing that. So, Kato, say something. Yes, <laughs> sorry. Um, first of all, uh, this is Kato Spiel. I am uh, I'm using they, them pronouns and I'm with Theo Wien in Austria. And um, so uh, there are a few things actually there. Uh, one of the things is there are disabled people. <laughs> um, I identify as disabled and chronically ill myself. I have um, I am neurodivergent and have a chronic thing going on that nobody wants to know. Um, uh, there are also accessibility chairs who are um, like I'm equity uh, just as an access chair and like under that or not under but like to that group together um there is a range of groups and uh, among those is the accessibility team which uh also uh consists of uh at least uh like partly consists of disabled people um they also have an assistant uh who um uh who helps as well so it's a big team that cares for that uh, i also want to say that i do not like from the beginning in january 2019 was the first time i saw the actual local place just because cliff talked a lot about the online experiences but i also want to talk about the local place and initially i have made i have tried to make very clear let's say it that way because um i have tried to make very clear that uh, it's also about disability culture making space for that and and just like making people actively feel welcome and not just ticking off boxes so um i do also welcome if you have any specific feedback of things that you think we might have not thought about to like contact either any of the teams, I volunteer them now, or me personally, um, to, uh, to create a good experience for you because that is uh, really uh, not just like, I think a Kai 2022 thing. It's to me also personally important that you do not make experiences like that at all, hopefully, but like, you know, where I can help to that.
Thank you, Kara, and thank you, Sushil. And I echo uh, Stacy's and Andrew's comments also in the chat. Uh, Jen, would you like to go next? Sure, thank you, uh, Neha. Uh, first, I wanted to just say that I'm really sorry that happened to you, Sushil, and um, Access SIGCHI is certainly another resource that you're welcome to lean on. For example, when we observed that not all SVs were knowledgeable about disability issues, we initiated a training process to try to improve the knowledge that SVs had, and your story suggests that maybe session chairs should also have um, the opportunity to learn about the diversity of people they might be working with. Um, and that's the kind of thing that Access SIGCHI tries to identify and innovate on and then help spread to conferences. So please feel free to get in touch with our group and we'd be happy to try to help as well. Um, regarding um, the nature of the, the upcoming conference, um, I had a question about the planning around um, virtual presentations um, and the choice to um, to have them be tied into the time zone. Um, and so I guess my question, well, so first of all, I just wanna say thank you to um, Cliff and to everyone for listening and thinking through all of these different options and trying to deal with all of the many concerns that have to be um, balanced against each other here. Um, my question about the, the timing is, um, it feels as though by um, tying it to the schedule in New Orleans, it's making it harder for the full international audience of CHI to participate in those sessions. And the innovations that were done with time zone, pre timed presentations happening multiple times for the online CHI were really incredible for making the one part of virtual conferencing that really can be more equal, I think. Um, work for people around the world. And so I guess I'm I'm really curious, you know, why that choice was made, because if the hybrid conference is prioritizing um, the value of the in-person experience around networking and the online conference is pri pri uh, prioritizing equity, I could see a different uh, path being taken. I'm sorry if that question wasn't clear, but I, I should stop talking now and let you respond, Cliff. <laughs> no, no, it's super clear. And it's a great question. I appreciate it. Um, it was a tough choice, right? Like there are two main reasons why uh, I think we made that choice. One was um, this year was gonna explode our costs. Like it was such a heavy burden for uh, our management company and for kind of our uh, paid infrastructure services that we pay for that with a 24 hour schedule, the contract they initially applied was triple the cost that they usually provide. So it was really, um, you know, it started off as kind of like a, uh, all right, that's a big price tag. Um, the other thing that we looked at was when we looked at kind of the, the reviews, the results from the CHI 2021 post uh, event survey, it was not, the 24 hour schedule wasn't actually very popular broadly, right? Like I think I, and just because something's not popular broadly doesn't mean it's not the right thing to do. Sometimes <laughs> the right thing to do is the right thing to do, whether or not people like it. But uh, given the two factors, we decided to try uh, to stick to the time zone, constrain our costs, and then try to see if we could find another way to be time zone friendlier, like like events kind of at the beginning and end of the central time zone, and then also um, uh, the uh, thinking about like these uh, late night events that are, are more informal and, and feel more like watch party types of things. So we're looking at how to be more time zone inclusive, but you're right. Like uh, I also was a fan of what CHI 2021 did. If it's the right thing for the CHI conference series to do, that's another thing I'll turn over to the CHI steering committee is to think about, do they mandate basically a 24 hour structure for CHI or, or how we do that? And Caroline, I see your hand is up. Would you like to add to what Cliff said or is it a different thing altogether? Yes, it's to add okay, to what please, please go ahead. Um, so I just want to make clear that we won't ask presenters to wake up in the middle of the night, remote presenters. So they can have the choice to actually, uh, so they will have to, uh, to contribute a pre-recorded video. And if they want to, hand, to handle every Q&A Q asynchronously, they will be able to do it. They also, uh, I mean, and the remote uh, audience will be able to actually consume content uh, at any time we broadcast, but we also record and make it available as soon as possible after the, the, the talks have been done. So, 
So that's just to add uh, to the idea that we won't force people to wake up in the middle of the night or to present at insane hours or whatever. So we will try to be as flexible as possible in terms of presentation options and also attendance options. Thank you. Uh, thanks for sharing that. All right, so I'm going to go back to the Slido comments. So there's a comment that says, or a question that says, it sort of feels like in-person is imminent. Taking aside extreme scenarios, what would need to happen for the in-person option to be off the table? I mean, that's a really good question. Uh, things we track, like I've actually been flipping that question around for the CHI steering committee and stuff like that. Um, the question I would ask instead is, if we look, look ahead to CHI 2023, what would have to change for us to feel comfortable for CHI 2023 to happen, right? What would actually change in the amount of inequity that we have or some of these other issues where we feel like we could have an in-person conference ever again? Um, for CHI 2023, that's the most imminent one. I think that that's a huge question. And, and the other question I would have is, um, what would have to change for any SIG CHI event to have an in-person component in the next six months? Um, we have REXIS happening with an in-person component. ICMI is happening with an in-person component. And those are smaller conferences, of course. Um, but they have the same basic inequity issues that we're talking about here. So that's where I would go back to the EC and render under Caesar what is Caesar's and say, you know, if this is an issue and that's the, the major point we're making the decision on, then I think that's a broader uh, SIG CHI decision, not an individual conference level decision. Thank you, Cliff. I think that is a question for the audience. If you'd like to weigh in, it's also uh, uh, a point uh, that we've noted, and I know that our VP conferences is here. So uh, thanks for that. I'm going to go back to the comments. So there is a comment in the chat that says from Brian, have you considered the registration price points between the in-person and online versions of the conference and the impact of these prices on which option people eventually choose? for attendance? Yeah, that's two really good questions there. So most likely the model in the budget models I've created so far is that we would follow the 2021 and 2019 models for pricing. Um, so the 2021 online pricing uh, model would look like, would basically what we would adopt for this year's pricing model. For the in-person event, that's actually mandated to us by the steering committee and the executive committee. We, as individual yearly organizers, don't have any agency over how much we charge for the conference. So that would be whatever they tell us to charge, which I imagine is gonna be the 2019 rates. Oh, and in terms of how that will affect people's participation, that's a big X factor. Um, uh like i that's the thing that kept me where that the one happy bit of me from the survey was seeing that people were interested in in-person conference i was very much in my head imagining having an in-person conference and then being the only person there with one sad beignet in my hand crying into the mississippi river thanks Cliff. um so next question or i think this is a comment from juan uh, many travel restrictions to the U.S. will change soon. The new rules, the White House said, would be rolled out in a phased approach. The first phase will kick off in early November and will allow fully vaccinated visitors traveling for non-essential reasons, like visiting friends or for tourism, to cross U.S. land borders. The second phase will start in early January 2022 and will apply the vaccination requirement to all inbound foreign travelers. Um, there's also a comment about travel uh, restrictions in the Slido, which I will pull up, but I think it was saying something to the effect that Louisiana may or may not uh, pass a state law that bans vaccine mandates. I guess that's not directly linked to travel, but linked to the location. Anything you want to say to that? Yeah, Louisiana also has, I think, regressive LGBTQIA laws. Um, their Napoleonic code of law is uh, bad. That's why I led that SIG CHI open letter or that SIG open letter to the, the SIG leadership saying, 
that ACM needs to really start thinking about the health and safety of their participants for where they place uh, conferences. Which the SIGs are not signing, but that on another day. Um, so Rua, could we go back to you? Um, I've been sitting on a few things and I put some things in the chat, but the one thing that I haven't put anywhere is my, I have a question that goes back to the survey and the qualitative answers. Um, is there a reason that the qualitative input needs to be analyzed before it's shared? Because my impression is that people shared their stories because they wanted their stories to be heard. I don't know that they shared their stories because they wanted somebody at CHI to analyze them and present them like a qualitative thematic analysis. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, analyze is probably the wrong word. I think, um, well, I'd love feedback on this, right? Should we just release the full set of open-ended answers uh, minus anything that's kind of personally identifying? I'd be happy to do that and just kind of like post them raw. I, I'm always happy for it as most transparent as possible. Um, when I was saying analysis, I meant like, are there themes that we should be thinking about? Like, and there, there are. Right, some and you know uh, probably forty percent of the open-ended responses don't have anything necessarily to do with the issue at hand, but there's still concerns about Kai and Kai organization. So um, I'm happy to take feedback on that. If people think it's appropriate to just post the raw open-ended, I would be super happy to do that. And there are some comments. Yeah, I don't know. I, don't, I can't quite remember what we told survey respondents. So I would, um, the EC has been very proactive about thinking about the privacy of our members with these things. And they're the ones that set the data policies. Um, I mean, if it were my yes. dream, I would share it with everyone, right? As long as it's not personally identifying, like I would share the data raw, but I can see why there might be reasons not to do that. Okay, so Rua, I was gonna read out your comment next, but since you're there, do you wanna just uh, say it out loud yourself? Okay, so um, one of the things that has been happening and that disabled people at CHI and in particular access to CHI has been talking about for a while is that disabled disability experts are not involved in site selection or platform contract negotiation. And so, that needs to change because that's where the access problems begin. And then what happens is we recruit disabled, usually junior scholars to be access chairs and then they bear the burden of the blame for poor access that happens. And it's just, it's exploitative and it's not, it's not, it's, we have to go back further. Site selection and platform selection. Midspace is trash. And anybody could have told you that within five minutes of playing with it. And they have not been helpful in, at least my experiences with them in 4S, they're just not prepared. And anybody could have told you that and you could have been using something more effective. Yeah, I'm definitely, well, uh, I'm not 4S, but yeah. So, so I actually remember, I don't know if you remember in uh, CHI 2019, you had a good provocation along these same lines when we did kind of that after meeting at the EC event. Um, and from that time, that's part of actually why we created the EJA, the Equity, Justice and Access Chairs position for CHI 2022 was in response to that. Um, so Kata was the third volunteer we brought on for CHI 2022, uh, very early in the process. And so we recruited that team as early as possible, but you're right by that point, all the decisions had already been made. So I think, and I'll let the steering committee speak for themselves, but what the steering committee has done is create new positions to also include more senior scholars from the accessibility community in kind of a rotating position there. Um, so I know Jen Mankoff, you did that for a while. Um, and so then that's an important position because it's at the steering committee level that they make the decisions about where the conferences are. So now I think because of the advocacy from your group, uh, yeah, and Raja is doing it now, um, because of the advocacy from your group, though there's that voice in that space now more. And it's, it's 
it's still not entirely unexploitative, but it's becoming hopefully less exploitative over time. Yeah, my question would be, does someone like Raja actually have influence and power to say this site and this platform are unacceptable? Because if not, then it still doesn't solve any of the problems where we come down to the organizing level and junior, disabled, marginalized scholars are blamed for bad access. Yeah, so I think like, for instance, I can't speak to the steering committee, but when I think about our um, deliberations over the platforms for Kai, if uh, Kata or Christina or anybody on the team had said, no, this, this platform is unacceptable, it's out the window, right? Like it's, there's no chance, I think we'd ignore their accessibility recommendations. Thank you. So we're getting close to the hour. I just want to summarize a few comments uh, quickly. So Rua also had another comment about majority sentiment in surveys saying that considering majority sentiment is a great way to dismiss and invalidate the needs of marginalized people. Cliff responded saying very much agree. Um, uh, there are comments about uh, the access to Kai letter. John Froelich said uh, to Kata, thank you for the letter. Uh, Cash mentioned that IUI is planned to be hybrid as well. Regan mentioned that re registration rates at CHI have not increased since 2008. Um, and then there were comments about sharing of stories, uh, concerns around privacy and also transparency. And um, I think, wait, there are a few more comments at the end. I, um, Let's just do one more raised hand. So Sushil, would you like to go next? Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> it took me time to unmute. Uh, I was commenting on an earlier comment that, you know, when there are disabled presenters or participants that they need to get in touch with people. I think the place where we want to go, I'm not talking about this will happen this year or even next year, but the way planners need to think about this is that we want to make our conferences accessible so that more disabled people actually come. There are lots of uh, disabled programmers who never come to our conferences because uh, they don't find them accessible. Thank you. Thank you, Sushir. Um, Liz had a question. So is there already a task force or chair chairs focused on developing the framework for CHI-22 watch parties? I'm just thinking that watch parties could produce good data to inform ideation around a more formal framework for re regional meetings. Also, is it feasible to work with existing regional CHIs in various countries on this? And I think Cliff asked, Liz, would you be interested in joining up and helping out? Um, Cliff, would you like to say more? Is it a general call for volunteers? We, I'll, I'll take whatever help I can get, right? <laughs> like, and especially like if you have a vision for that or, or think like you would like, that's a, that's a, like mostly if you really care, if you have a passion for sorting something out, I usually find those make great volunteers, right? And so, um, you know, we love uh, having people join our team. So yeah, Liz, if you're, uh, email me, I'm at cacl at umich.edu. If you'd like to play ball on that, I'd love to have you on board. Thank you, Cliff. Um, I was two Americanisms in once. I apologize. Like I'm trying to get better at that. If you'd like to join the team, we will be happy to welcome you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Kale, I'm not sure what you said plus when do I think it was to Liz's comment, but also uh, added, uh, given the four-year lead when conducting site selection, it does mean some changes to equity and access are catching up. Um, Jumping ahead, Rua said, I've been told that it has been changed from Clouder slash Midspace to Hub. Let's hope Hub team is more concerned with access than Midspace. Um, 
Brian mentioned I will be leaving. I would like to thank all the organizers uh, for having to deal with all these very difficult decisions. Long term, I worry that we expect too much from volunteers trying to organize conferences. I think that's a good note to end this um, session on. So thank you uh, for that comment, Brian. I think you're not there anymore. Uh, but thank you to Cliff, to Simone, to uh, Caroline, to Kata, to everyone who's been here to answer all these questions. We'll be continuing on Tuesday. So whatever we've missed out today and on Slido, we'll probably continue from there and we'll um, uh, be continuing these conversations elsewhere. Cliff, anything you want to add? No, just we're always here to listen. And uh, I think on the Kind Meta thread, I put my email and phone number. So really call me if you if you want to, if you didn't feel like this got enough, you know, and you want to yell at me, I'm always available. Well, we very much appreciate all of you for, uh, for doing this. Thank you. Thank you all. So is the recording going to be stopped? Ah, good point. Hey. Christy, could you stop the recording on your end? Who's host? Oh. Wait, is Christy 